My name is Nicolás Kisig Aguirre. Um, I'm Peruvian, but I currently live in Boston. And um, that's where I'm finishing my master's at MIT. Um, I'm going to talk tonight, today, this afternoon, about um, sound. And uh, I'm really interested in sound because it is very powerful, not necessarily in a musical sense, but also, for example, sound can be used as a weapon. Um, when the presentation loads, we'll see some <laughs> pictures about it. Um, but um, sound is very... Um, so it's very powerful because it can be used as a weapon, for example, in um, situations like this one where this policeman is carrying not a gun, um, he's not carrying something that shoots other, than other things that sound. Um, this is called a long-range acoustic device, and um, it's meant to, to expel super high-pitched and uh, very loud, extremely loud sound to crowds of protesters, for example. That's probably what this police was going to do after this picture, or he was doing while this picture was taken in Toronto. So, um, there's other examples of sound being used as a weapon. This aircraft is capable of supersonic speed, and uh, when that happens, a sonic boom, which is extremely loud, um, is generated. And the sonic boom has been used uh, not, not long ago, in the Middle East, for example, uh, to keep entire populations during days and days under non-lethal attack. So that's what, uh, what many people say, it's, it's non-lethal, it's better than killing. Uh, but it's actually very damaging. And in the battlefield, uh, sound has been used. Uh, there's a history of sound being used as a weapon, uh, not necessarily always to damage directly with sound. But for example, these guys, um, they are called the Ghost Army. They are a secret. They were a secret division in World War II, from United States, and they were a bunch of uh, artists and designers, and you know they were not really soldiers, and they're they're. Uh, mission was to trick the Nazis into confusion and to uh, make them think, for example, that the enemy was uh, bigger somewhere else, etc. So that's what they did with sound. Um, and they would trick the Nazis to thinking that the enemy was somewhere else, for example. This guy here uh, is in South Korea. He's finishing some details in a huge sound tower that uh, the South Korean military would deploy along the border with North, Co North Korea. And um, they would start blasting sound that would, you know, cross the border. Not nobody crossed the border, but the sound, and it would reach the closest um, villages in North Korea. And they would start blasting propaganda and even a little bit of K-pop. Probably because of the K-pop, North Korea started replying with fire. You know, so it a <laughs> it's a no-go. So you know, this image is very typical from North Korea, where they have these demonstrations of uh, military might. And uh, these marches make me think also on this power, within this uh, power of sound, the power of rhythm specifically. The coordination of so many units, of sources of sound. Think about the sound of the march, you know, and think how that can intimidate and how can that reveal some sort of message. And percussion is not really uh, new in the military either. Like uh, uh, the drums um, um, have been known to be used to mark the military marching, but also other uses. These guys. Um, were called the drumming boys, and they were essential um, in the North American Civil War, where uh, in the battlefield where it was really difficult to communicate with speech, or where you didn't want other people to understand what you were trying to deliver as a message, drumming would be the tool. So these guys would drum different patterns, and they would, you know, tell their troops to um, come, go somewhere else, or to attack, or to retreat. And of course, that was not invented in the United States. Um, I mean, the use of drums um, in, in, in warfare, in a way. Um, these are Ashanti uh, war drums that were notable, or are notable, in trying to scare the enemy, because uh, when you scratch the surface with a special tool, they uh, recreate the sound of a roar of a leopard. So they would hide behind the bushes and strike. You know, so you would think there's a leopard there, you just go. You don't attack. Also in Africa and in many other places, uh, drumming in ceremonial percussion in, in ceremonial and ritual activities has been super powerful. And it has been demonstrated that rhythmic drumming um, is capable of, of driving groups of people into altered states of consciousness. It's very powerful. 
Now, uh, when African slaves arrived to Peru, um, they were forbidden to use their drums um, because they would, they would talk with the drums, they would communicate the, with the drums. So um, African slaves in Peru were very smart and very intelligent to uh, grab the wooden boxes that were used to transport uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, like crates, and they would start using it to, as a percussion instrument, you know. It's the cajon, is this instrument where you sit on top and you just strum, uh, uh, you just play the rhythms that you want. So it's a very simple tool, a very simple weapon also, in a way. Nowadays, it's also a very popular musical instrument, no? the Peruvian cajon. Um, Peruvian Cajon now brings people together, it continues to bring people together around Peru, and um, it does so like nowadays also like in public space. Um, now you have to think in the um, situation in Peru where, you know, uh, African slaves would communicate using drums instead of speech, because speech was forbidden, one has to think that, of course, the level of complexity of the communication is lower, but the level of oppression is so high that you need to go to other tools. Anyways, the use of uh, percussion and drumming in public space also leads me to other situations of protest. Um, this one in particular in Montreal, uh, where this very simple weapon, again, pans, pots, uh, you know, and wooden spoons, would end up uh, making super high levels of noise. Um, and they would contest also the noise that the police was trying to do with their batons, trying to intimidate the protesters. Um, it's very powerful in a political sense. Now, um, to try to continue exploring, researching, um, you know, continue asking myself questions about the power of rhythm, the power of percussion, the power of drumming, I created this machine. It's a modular rhythm machine, that's how I call it. It's here with us on stage, and towards the end, it's going to make a little performance. Um, and uh, it's made out of uh, relatively small, you can see them here, two uh, units, modules, and uh, equipped with a, it's a tool, right, it's an instrument. So I, I thought that it had to be as versatile as possible and it, it had to reach all of the possibilities uh, that I wanted in the future without really knowing exactly what I wanted it to do. So it has a sensor for proximity, it has a drumstick attached to one motor, in this case it has two drumsticks. Um, um, this is a new thing I did for, uh, for today. Um, it has a membrane that's made out of wood, similar to the cajon, and it has like a resonance chamber. And of course, it also has this triangular shape because um, um, you can stack them together, and this triangular shape is very good um, uh, in resisting, in, in delivering the charges. You know, it's like a structural thing. Um, it has some other uh, connections so that you can st you can connect them in many different ways, shapes, etc. So it's modular. You can I can make more. Anybody of you can also make them because there are the plans and everything is online. Uh, it's like an open source project. And um, um, uh, so I can make more. I can make 100 if I want, and I can join them, although it's a lot of work. And uh, uh, I can also bring a, 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 a smaller group like tonight, like this afternoon here. Um, and I can arrange them in different ways. I had the chance to present the modular rhythm machine um, in MIT for the first time with an experiment I called experiment number one because it was the first experiment. Uh, <laughs> so that's me again with my funky glasses. Um, and that's all of the people that were saying, what is this guy doing? Um, and that's what was happening. Okay, so this is just like a 15 second extract of uh, an eight minute piece that was experiment number one, where it started really slowly and then it ended in a super chaotic moment. And I was just trying to explore and understand what was the difference between only one single drum playing or multiple drums playing at the same time, what happened between coordination and chaos, etc. It didn't lead me to many answers, but it led me to many other questions, which is the most important. Uh, and most recently, I was in, um, uh, in the month of September. September in Austria in a festival called Ars Electronica. It was an amazing experience because I set up the whole machine there. Um, I made that, uh, by the way, I made 36 modules. Um, and uh, 
I set up the whole machine there and all the sensors were constantly trying to detect the proximity of people. The, the higher the amount of people in front of the machine, the machine would start going crazy, you know? And in the end, it started working as an alarm system or detection system, you know, where uh, the machine would, would give a, a different pattern according to, to the amount of people in front of it. When I go back to MIT, I'm going to set the machine up uh, in the MIT Museum. And uh, that's another opportunity, and I'm very happy for it. And I'm going to try to explore uh, um, percussion, rhythm, and uh, the possibility of encoding messages and crypto, uh, crypto message, cryptophony, I, I call it, but I'm not really sure if that's a word. Um, and for tonight, uh, eight of these uh, units have come all the way, and uh, I prepared a small um, uh, but intense uh, performance, so I hope you can enjoy it. <laughs>